this is a great day, uh, long, long anticipated, two and a half years. And um, just the concept of doing Martin Luther King Jr. is awesome. And to have traveled the journey to this point is um, tremendous. Martin Luther King means so much to the world. And in this time, with the tensions that exist, uh, it means so much more. It was a growing process. Um, you start with certain preconceptions, then you have to look deeper. Uh, then you had the problem of doing it twice life size. So just getting the proportions to read correctly, um, you know, I had to be, I had to do and redo. It, it, it took um, quite a struggle to get his likeness, and I know that would have been, that is important getting the proportions, the general proportions, the movement, etc. The statue itself is 12 feet tall, so that's twice life size, and it will stand on a six foot pedestal. The, the location is, 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 couldn't be better. I couldn't ask for more. Um, so it will be central to the life of Atlanta for as long as it stands, forever, I hope. And um, so it's, it's an honor that is a legacy not just for myself but um, for my generations to come. So I'm excited about that. You start your career dreaming about possibly doing something really significant that impacts the world uh, or your world. And, but you never really think what it can be or if it will really happen, but you, you dream about it. You slowly prepare yourself. Uh, for the next and the next and the next task and this is like uh, a dream come true because it not only affects my world um, I think this will have an impact on the world in general As we get started, I'd love for you to dive in and let us know, you know, as we are celebrating the Caribbean, where are you from? It's an honor to be selected by Carib Nations um, and given this honor. So I am from Jamaica. I was born in Jamaica. I was uh, conceived in oh. England. My parents were living there at the time and uh, I my mother went home to have me in Jamaica while my older brother was born in, in the UK. Um, I grew up in Jamaica, uh, going through the high school system, then on to the Jamaica School of Art, where I, I studied art. Uh, I was following, in some respects, in my father's footsteps, mm -hmm. because he's an artist, and um, I've been exposed to art from uh, birth. So. You know, it was something that it was in me. And uh, by mid high school, I made a decision that uh, this is what I wanted to do. And um, so I, I started setting out pursuing how do I educate myself, whether in Jamaica or going abroad. The Jamaica School of Art was at a dynamic stage at the time. And I was encouraged to study there. Um, so that's basically the start of things, yeah. Mm -hmm. And how did you get started specifically in sculpting? Because I know you just mentioned that you were inspired to become an artist by your father and through some of your training. How did sculpting become a part of your process and work? Well, uh, my father is a painter, um, I, a figurative painter. And um, he introduced me to drawing by seeing his drawings and um, his, especially his renditions of the human figure. And that is what captivated me in the beginning. I always thought that I would continue on to be a painter, but once reaching the School of Art, uh, I met 
Christopher Gonzalez, Gene Pearson. As I say, it was a very dynamic time sculpture. Um, just got its hooks in me. And I, fight, I felt that drawing translated very well to sculpture mm -hmm. and uh, had a feel for it. And so I, from very early in art school, decided sculpture is what I wanted to do. Yeah. And oftentimes you hear a lot about artists who find it difficult to translate that passion and interest for art into a career. You left Jamaica and moved to the US. How have you, um, what are, are some of the struggles and some of the successes that you've achieved um, in making this a career? Well, from, from Jamaica, um, uh, living in Jamaica, I, my career had developed quite considerably. Um, I had a good example in my father in ways in which I could develop it as a career. And in Jamaica, I was making great strides and I came to the United States really to put my, my career on a more international stage. I found um, the limitations in Jamaica were a bit stifling. And so I came here with the expressed intention to continue my art career never doubting at any point that that is what I intend to do. Um, it was a difficult transition because I was probably middle-aged and not willing to beat the pavement as I did when I was 20. Uh, so it was, it was slow getting involved, getting that recognition for my work and um, very difficult in the very early stages, but I kept consistent to putting out the best work possible at all times, making great sacrifices, um, you know, underbidding just to get the opportunity to do the work and, and show the work. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it slowly, very slowly grew. Um, it was also just before the depression, so the arts was, um, in uh, tight streets, so to speak. Uh, so it was a very difficult transition, but slowly but surely it began to rise. Uh, one of the things that always kept me buoyant was staying true to my Jamaican heritage. I always promoted myself as a Jamaican sculptor. Um, you know, I might be considered African-American, but I am Jamaican first. And Jamaica has been a great support even while I am here. So it is, it is one of the platforms that um, has kept me buoyant. You talked a lot about your, your, some of the struggles when you first moved here. What about some of the work that has really brought you recognition? Uh, what have been some of those pieces that you are really proud of that you've seen displayed here? Oh, uh, well, what gave me a great leg up was the support from Jamaica and, and, and many of the Jamaican works that I had done. I think uh, Usain Bolt and his international prominence um, was a major boost in terms of my work being recognized. Um, I had done a few minor uh, public sculpture uh, projects here in the United States. But I think Bolt um, was, was quite a lift. And the other athletes that continued afterwards, Miss Lou um, was a very important commission too uh, that gave me some recognition in mm -hmm. Canada and beyond just athletics. And I think when the Martin Luther King opportunity came, came around, I think my strength that was demonstrated in works that were done in Jamaica, previous works here, um, you know, it, it played well for me. It, it, gave, it showed my strengths, actually. Your work has made quite the statement as well. So uh, as much as you see the day today, I think, you know, what we see is nothing but performance. Uh, so it's such a honor to recognize you as well. Now, one of the, the pieces that I think this award really tries to do is highlight Caribbean Americans 
who are really, you know, making a name for themselves, also making a name for the Caribbean community. What do you see as your role in advancing the Caribbean diaspora community? Do you think you have a role in that? Uh, well, uh, I am accepting um, a role that is being thrust upon me. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, I find that coming from the Caribbean, living in a black consciousness community where all our leaders are um, black uh, to some degree, you, you do have, or we do have our class issues that we deal with, but it is generally a black consciousness community. But we are living here in the United States in what is um, more multiracial and predominantly a white consciousness um, community. And the confidence, the strength, the recognition of our being it growing in the Caribbean is, is so strong. And I think that is one of the things that helps Caribbean people to get into leadership positions here in, in the United States in all the areas, whether it's culture or politics or uh, and, uh, economics, whatever. And so to promote this concept of our and reaffirmation of our strength and our personality, um, I think is very important. And um, I think this is what is making um, the Caribbean community so outstanding. What advice might you have for a young person of Caribbean heritage, whether they are back in Jamaica like you were or living here in the US, striving to or dreaming of pursuing a career in the arts? What, what advice would you give to them to set course for a career similar to yours? Um, I would say um, hold fast, uh, stay true to your Caribbean heritage, recognize the strength and quality in that, um, continue to promote yourself as a Caribbean person um, and re recognize, ride on the, the qualities that um, are coming from your, your heritage. You must evolve, um, you will be influenced by um, whatever conditions you find yourself in, in the diaspora. And, but the Jamaican connection, the Jamaican route is, is very important. When I go home to Jamaica and I see the, the rhythm, the attitude, the, the vibe of the Jamaican people, it is, it is unique. And if we recognize that quality, um, it, will, it will shine wherever in the world you place it. So um, I think we can tap into that a lot. Uh, other things might influence and, and dominate, but you know, keep tapping into that, that culture. Yeah. One of the things you mentioned earlier was that, you know, while you were in Jamaica, while you had great um, representation and example of how to thrive as an artist in Jamaica and your work was recognized there, there was still a, a level of maybe feeling stifled. Um, what do you think we need in the Caribbean to create spaces where our artists can thrive? Well, what drove me to leave Jamaica and was um, this gap in terms of connecting Jamaican art to the international stage. Mm -hmm. And if those routes, those bridges can be developed, it was difficult for me to get my work outside of Jamaica or get that recognition. It was difficult for me to become part of the broad international community. And if we can find ways of building those bridges where artists in Jamaica, people are coming to Jamaica for our art and culture. People do go to Jamaica for the music and for the food. Uh, we want them to go there for the fine arts too and recognize that the fine arts is, you know, um, the temperature is high there. So I think that is 
a major part. When, when Jamaica sells itself, we need to sell our fine arts as well. People come for the, the culture. And um, I think it's growing. I think uh, culture tourism is being recognized as probably the foundation. And uh, so the, the, the prospects are, are great. The, the future is, is bright. And Jamaica, I think, is at that, that uh, kind of moment where, and the Caribbean, where um, we are on the cusp of exploding, really exploding in a big way. Oh, exciting. So can you tell us a little bit about who some of your favorite artists in the diaspora are? Um, could be Jamaican, could be otherwise. Do you have any artists who you are watching or keeping your eye on? Well, part of the shortfall is that even within the Caribbean, there's not enough uh, cross-fertilization and um, recognizing our Caribbean-ness and, and, and developing on that. Um, so most of my influences were Jamaica. Um, so it started, well, my father, obviously, he is the, the greatest influence uh, in my career, whether consciously or subconsciously. And then growing up, Alexander Cooper was a great influence while I was in high school and through um, the School of Art and continuing. Um, his support was invaluable. And um, in the arts, his, for me, is like a second father. Uh, then you have Christopher Gonzalez was, was a very strong influence when I was in um, the art school. He was my first. The tutor introduced me to sculpture. Um, other three dimensional artists, uh, Gene Pearson, um, Albert Huey, and his connection to the, the, the earth of, of, of Jamaica. You know, so um, a lot of Jamaican art, I would say predominantly Jamaican influence. And uh, remember that for the first 44 years of my life, I basically. Um, lived in Jamaica and worked in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, that route is there. Yeah. So I see a fantastic sculpture behind you. Can you tell us a little bit about that sculpture and what led to that project? Well, that, this is the study bust of Martin Luther King when I was doing the, the King Monument for the city of Atlanta. Um, so... In, in doing the work, going through the process of the work, um, this study evolved. Uh, it was a commission put out, a commission call put out by the city of Atlanta to do a 12 foot sculpture of Martin Luther King for a prominent area on Martin Luther King Boulevard. The entire boulevard is being developed uh, in terms of road restructuring and about six different public art projects. And King was part of that. Um, so I put in the bid, um, I understand that there were over 80 applicants and, um, I was fortunate enough to, to, um, win the, win the commission. It mm -hmm. took me about two years. Uh, so it stands, um, Martin Luther King Boulevard, just behind the Mercedes Benz Stadium, uh, of King releasing a dove and his message of peace and love as being, the values that will carry us forward. So around the base, we have the quotes, um, darkness cannot eradicate darkness, only light can. Hate cannot eradicate hate, only love can. So that message was, was the key theme of, of the work. Mm -hmm. Gosh, and when we think about, you know, civil rights, when we think about um, that era, there are so many ties to the Caribbean as well. Um, can you tell us a little bit about any projects that you're working on right now or have out in the well, works? Most excitingly is the, the Wind Rush Generation project mm -hmm. that I'm working on for Britain. The, the government of, of England has had put out a, a, a declaration that they were supporting a monument to the Wind Rush Generation um, for those who might not be fully familiar, the Windows Generation is 
the people who went to Britain after World War II uh, to help rebuild Britain when labor was short and there was a lot of destruction in Britain and the call throughout the British Caribbean in particular was answered by a lot of Caribbean people and a lot of Jamaican people. So they went there and the community, as we generally do, was a great influence in the general life and culture of, of Britain that contributed tremendously, contributes, still contributes tremendously. And they experienced a lot of unfair treatment then and uh, up until recently. Um, so because of that um, fallout, the government has made an, uh, an attempt to, re to compensate and they are putting up this monument in Waterloo Station, which is the transit hub of, of Britain. And um, this is to be unveiled on Windrush Day 2022. So I am working on that now um, to get it completed in time for the unveiling. Wow. And you know, when you do these types of work, are you the only one developing these sculptures or do you have a team that you work with? How does that, how does the uh, actual well, sculpture get done? In terms of, of the team, um, it is primarily a one man, two man team in that my wife is, is my biggest critic and, and supporter. But um, the concept is, is generally developed by me over time, you know, talking to people, interacting, and that collaborative process, but it's generally developing. And then I would develop studies that would flesh out this concept. Mm -hmm. And then as I look to enlarge it and develop it even more, because as it grows, it develops more, it grows, it has its own life. I do contract people to assist in the fabrication and and, and well, uh, yeah, basically the fabrication of the, of the piece. Yeah. So um, in that process, the fabrication process, I do have collaboration, but in terms of the concept, it is um, driven by, I guess, my artistic vision. I'm hearing this trend to an extent, you know, the MLK Memorial and statue, the Windrush Generation and statue, you know, recognizing our Caribbean and Jamaican sports uh, stars and track and field stars. And there's an element there that connects art almost to social justice, right? Um, where, But a lot of people think art is just for art. Can you tell me a little bit about the artist's role in social justice from your perspective? Well, the artist's role in life first and foremost, is, is to explore, uh, I think, to explore the human condition, whether it's landscape, figures, uh, private or public concepts. And um, it started on, on a personal, a private level, um, just drawing people, sculpting people that I see. And it grows and, you know, the evolution of life or our concepts or view, appreciation of life grows. And um, so, you know, more and more, you start to look at social issues. Um, that began for me from very early, you know, apartheid was, was a major theme that I explored in the 80s, 90s. And um, right now, in, worldwide, I think, social justice, civil, um, civil rights, I think, is at a high point mm -hmm. and one can't help but get engaged. Mm -hmm. um, as if you're going to talk about humanity, you have to talk about these things. And art has always been um, a, a forum for the expression of these things and various uh, communities use art in, in various ways as we are seeing that uh, not all the all the ways in which art was used was positive. It was used as an oppressive tool as well. So it must be used as a liberating tool as well. And I've always promoted public sculpture um, 
the having this public dialogue, uh, put con putting concepts out that the public can engage in and uh, appreciate. Um, so it was always an integral part of my career. And um, yeah, it's becoming more and more important. And uh, my voice is being heard a little bit more, which I appreciate. And uh, it gives me the opportunity to, um, to influence and, and to uh, create positive discussion in our community. So, you know, art has always had and will always have that, that, that capacity. And um, I think especially black people, um, we have not had all the opportunities that we, we deserved and um, our voice is getting stronger. So, you know, long may it continue to grow. Gosh, it is such an honor to get to have this conversation with you. Um, you know, as I get these names that I am recognizing through these interviews, you know, I get to read up on bios, but having this conversation with you, Basil, has been so rich uh, to get to understand not just your story and your work as an artist and a sculptor, but also the passion that you bring to your work as well. Um, how can we as a Caribbean community, how can I as a Caribbean person here in the U.S. support you and support your work? Well, I, um, you all, we are, the, every, the Caribbean community has been supported and I'm overwhelmed at the level of support. Um, I think uh, supporting the arts in general, supporting the next generation, I think, you know, I have, um, I have come a long way and there are those who need, uh, and in that journey, I've had so much, so many hands helping me forward. Um, the important thing now is to pass it forward. Um, you know, so I think that is where the community needs to engage in helping me to pass it forward. And um, in whichever way in the arts, keep passing it forward, basically. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time this morning. It's been such a pleasure. I'm looking forward to the award ceremony and I'm sure you are as well. Uh, congratulations on this honor. And I know we will be hearing much, much more from you and your career as well. So thanks so much, Basil Watson. Thank you very much. And I really appreciate it and all the support that I'm getting.